Okay, so now let's come back to Pals 2010, the second one of the drugs uh, series. We'll finish up the drugs here. And we'll start off with lidocaine. Now, I'm a little surprised to see lidocaines here because it's not really in the ACLS ones, but because we, we, it's not as good as an, an antiarrhythmic as amiodarone is. But here's a dose of milligram per kg bolus and then 20 micrograms per kg per minute as a drip. And while it might help you terminate any dysrhythmias that the patient has, lidocaine, and actually amiodarone for that matter, has not been shown to help patient survival. It hasn't helped patients get discharged out of the hospital. But it sure makes us look, feel better when we see that uh, VTAC or whatever go back to a sinus rhythm. Next is magnesium. And here's the dose. 25 to 50 milligrams per kg. You give it slowly because it can cause hypotension. And the max you want to give is 2 grams. And the only time you really are going to give this are for documented cases of hypomagnesemia or torsad, which could be caused by the hypomagnesemia. And you'll remember that torsad is a polymorphic ventricular tachycardia that occurs in patients who have a prolonged QT. And the cause of this can be hypomagnesemia, hypocalcemia, hypokalemia, lots of other things, certain drugs, congenital. And so if you're suspecting or you see on an old EKG they had a prolonged QT, they're in a polymorphic VTAC, go ahead and try some magnesium, but it's not recommended to be routinely given. So procainamide is back in style. Uh, procainamide, you're going to give, this is the adult IV dose, you're going to give 20 mg per minute. And how much do you give? Well, you give up to a max of 15 milligrams per kilogram. So you do want to give it slowly until the arrhythmia stops or the if the QT widens or the QRS slows down or, or expands, it, it grows 50%. Or if the patient develops heart block or hypotension. And the way that procainamide works is it depresses or it actually you know, it prolongs the refractory period of the heart and it slows down conduction. So this explains some of these symptoms that you're really going to see here, right? Because as the refractory period uh, expands, the QT is going to get longer. As conduction slows, you can develop a heart block as, as this gets very, very, as it gets completely blocked actually. And as the QRS widens, conduction through here is going to slow down, uh, and that's what makes the QRS widen. And another note of caution, another drug that's going to increase your QT is amiodarone, right? And so if you give both of these drugs, uh, then you're probably going to push your patient into torsad. So if for some reason you have to give procainamide and amiodarone, I would do that in consultation with a pediatric cardiologist. Heck, any time that I'm giving procainamide, I probably would be talking to the pediatric cardiologist anyway. They also mentioned sodium bicarbonate, and here's the, the dosage, one milliequivalent per kg per dose. But in a code scenario, this really doesn't have a role. It's good for certain things, like if you have a toxicologic ingestion, then maybe you need to give sodium bicarbonate but it does not really have a role. Even if you got a patient who's profoundly acidotic, fix the acidosis. This is going to only give you temporary uh, fixing of the numbers, but not really doing much for your patient. So, no real role. Similarly, they also mentioned vasopressin, which is a drug that we use in adult uh, arrest. But in pediatric arrest, it's not been shown to be helpful, so you don't have to worry about that one. And so this gets us through the drugs that we're going to use. So next video, let's go through one. Let's look at pulseless arrest. All right, I'll see you there.